You look wonderful tonight. Amen. Yes, you do. And let's all point at Pastor Sanjay and say, Pastor Sanjay, you look wonderful tonight. Amen. And as Bobna smiles with a wonderful smile, let's look to his lovely bride. Give a hand clap of praise because behind every great Torah scholar is a Torah lifter. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord for you. Thank you. Let us begin and open with the prayer for Torah tonight. Repeat after me. Baruch Atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher kedidshanu Bimitzvotav Bimitzvanu La'asok Bidebri Torah Believe it or not, that was the memorization of the prayer because this is a completely different one and it took me by surprise. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we worship your holy name. Amen. Praise Amen. God for, for memorizing the Torah prayer. And if you would, let's just open tonight with the Shema. Let's begin. Shema Israel. Thank you, Lord, and we give you all of our praise tonight. Together we all say, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Rebbe Gregory. And before you're seated, I just want to say, pray one more prayer. And Lord, tonight I just ask you that you just take over this service. And Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise. We just thank you for the Torah that, you're gonna, that you will teach us this evening. And Lord, I, I pray that we, we will be totally transformed in every aspect of our character, every aspect of our destiny. And may we come to a full of understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' holy name we all pray. We all Amen. say? Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tonight we are... For November 1st, 2018, we are, we are in Parsha Haya Sarah. Can you say that with me? Parsha Haya Sarah. Parsha means Torah portion. Haya Sarah means the life of Sarah. And we're going to talk about the, the, the life of Sarah this evening, taken from Genesis chapter 23 all the way through chapter 25, verse 18. In Hebrew, the name Genesis is Berisha. Can we say it together? Berisha? And tonight we're going to talk about how to experience spiritual saturation. How many of you want to live a lifestyle where God's presence is imbued into every aspect of your living? Yes. That His presence is there and you know you're in His will. Amen. And even, when you, even when you can't feel His presence, you know that He's, he's right there with you. And you know that you're, work, you're moving in His presence. Yes. Feel, being in His presence doesn't mean that you feel goosebumps all the time. Being in His presence means that you're in His will all the time. Amen? And I want to read to you an excerpt from a book called Life is a Test. Can you look at your neighbor and say, Life is a Test? Life is a test. And look at your other neighbor and say, Life is a Text. Life is a Text. That part was a joke. And I want to, re I want to read to you from Esther, from Rabitzin Esther Jungreis' book, one of my favorite Rabitzins in all of my studies. And this is what she says. From the moment we are born... To the day that God calls us, we are tested. Look at your neighbor and say, we are tested. In essence, everything is a test. And once we absorb this, 
it will become easier to bear the many challenges and trials of life. These tests come in many shapes and forms. The way we relate to God, to our parents, our teachers, our peers, our neighbors, our co-workers, our colleagues, even to a clerk in a store, the waiter in a restaurant, or a fellow driver on the road, are all tests. These tests reflect the genuineness of our commitment, the depth of our faith, and the measure of our character. And at the end of the day, we are marked pass or fail. Look at your neighbor and say pass. Pass. And then she goes on to say, in the university on high, even little things, things that we would normally consider insignificant, count, and therefore are test. Everything in your life is a test. Nothing that's placed in your path is there just by coincidence. There is no such word or concept of coincidence in the Hebrew language. Life is a test and everything that comes our way is a test. Amen. And the way we re react will determine if we get a pass or a fail. The beauty of God's test is if we blow it, we get the, we get the test again. And sometimes again. Sometimes again and again. Sometimes we, we spend over 40 years working on the same test. But my prayer is that we won't spend more than a couple weeks through each test. Amen. Amen. And again, tonight's Torah portion is Parsha Haya Sarah. Can you say it with me? Parsha Haya Sarah. And Haya Sarah means what? The life of Sarah. And just as, just as Sarah lived life to the very fullest, she experienced the full depth, the full breadth, the full height, the full measure of life. And likewise, God wants you to live the more abundant life. He wants you to experience the fullness of life. Some of us live life in a manner that we can't wait to get it over with. We just can't wait to get it over with. You know, that's how, that's how I treat my exams. I can't wait till it's over. But that's not how we should treat life. We need to fully experience the test. And don't focus on the end result, focus on the process of life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is what Paul said, the Apostle Paul said this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. I thank my God always on your behalf. So what are you going to do through every single test? You You're going to thank God. Amen? Amen? For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. So how do you get through every test? You, you rely upon the grace of God. Mm -hmm. The grace of God is, it will enable you and give you the gavora, the strength, to pass every test. Yes. And then it, verse 5 says that in everything you are enriched by Him. That means through every process of life, through every instance, every instance of your life, every snapshot of your life, every like on your social media account, through everything in your life, you are being enriched. Amen? Amen. And I, I, don't, I meant that as a bit of a joke, but what I, what I do mean is don't let anything in life pass you by. Allow, I mean, even if you're going through the most difficult, excruciating pain of your life, even if you've gone through a painful divorce, no matter what you've gone through, do your very best to allow God's light to shine through every circle, every single circumstance. Now, in all my years of, be, of, of being in ministry, I have not seen anyone with a perfect life. So if you do have a perfect, perfect life, please see me after the service. And if you do have a perfect life online, please, po please post a comment so I can get back to you afterward. Because I want to know the secret to a perfect life. And verse 7 reads, So that ye may come behind in no gift, for waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every test is bringing you one step closer into completion. Your tests have a design for you from heaven. Every one of you have custom built tests. Tests that you need for you to come into the fullness of your calling in Christ Jesus. So not, 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 no two of us have the same exact test. My tests are different than my wife Bobna's test. All of us have d different tests that God has designed for us for our greatness. Amen? 
Now I'm going to ask you all a question. I meant to ask this earlier, but how many of you have ever heard this about women that, that never reveal a woman's age? How many of you have heard that? Yeah. Now, Bhavna, is that also apply in India as well? Or is that just, maybe that's just an American concept? I don't, I don't know. So, because this Parsha, Genesis 23, 1, it says, And the life of Sarah was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And this is the only time that we read about the lifespan of a woman in the Bible. You know, we hear about Abraham, Noah, Adam, David, and many others. We, learn, we, know, what the, we know how long they lived. We know when, at what age they died. But this is the only instance in the Torah that I know of where a woman's lifespan is revealed. And there's something very unique about this. And, you know, in our culture, we said, you know, women very rarely reveal their age. Do you know why that is? All right. I was, uh, well, this, is, this is what I found in a Google search. By asking a lady such a question, you are drawing attention to the fact that she is not as young as she once was. <laughs> and therefore, perhaps not attractive as she once was. It is embarrassing for her to have to answer the question and places her in a situation where she may choose to tell a small lie. <laughs> now, I've heard all my life that you never ask a, a lady what her age is. I've, I've, I've always heard that, but I never knew why, and I still, I still don't know the answer. But he, there's, a, there's a Torah teaching from the rabbinic commentary that I was reading. It says that the Torah will never reveal a woman's age either. So by not revealing your age, ladies, and most of this class are, are ladies. If you're a lady, please raise your hand. <laughs> so <laughs> that was for Pastor Michael. <laughs> <laughs> he laughs at my jokes, and I love that. Um, you, the Torah never, never reveals the age of a woman either. So, which I found very interesting. Yep. So, it has something to do with honor to honor women, and the Torah never reveals the age. The Torah never records a woman's age except in this one instance. The Torah doesn't tell us the age of Eve when she died. The Torah doesn't tell us when Rebecca died. It doesn't tell us the age of when Rachel and Leah died. It doesn't tell us the age of when Hannah died. But we hear so many instances, we, we know of the ages of, of, some, of many of the great men that died. So that, that's, a very, that's very interesting, isn't it? But the Torah goes out of its way to, to make an exception. Can you look at your neighbor and say, make an exception? Whenever you see an exception in the Word of God, that means we need to, play, we need to pay close attention to what's going on here. Because the Torah is stressing the unequaled value of Sarah and why the, her lifespan is so emphasized. Because Sarah's life does not end with, with her death. It doesn't, the scripture does not say that Sarah died at 127. It says that her life was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years, I'm paraphrasing, but basically 127 years. But the, as, when Moses wrote this, he doesn't bring out her death was at, after 127 years. It says that her lifespan was 127 years. So we need to focus on the life and not upon the death. Amen? So, and, it, and the wording is a little bit odd, isn't it? It says 100 years and 20 years, and 7 years. It seems a little bit redundant. The word years is mentioned three times. Also, pay attention to that. There are no meaningless details in the Bible. The, the, more, in, the more engaged you are in the, in the study of the Word of God, the more you're going to receive out of it. Amen? Amen? Her life... Her life does, did not end when she died. But her values, what she taught, her nature, her, 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 her position as, a, as the first matriarch of the Jewish people, as a mother of the nations, it continues on. And it, and it will not end. I mean, this is the mother of the Jewish faith. We focus on Abraham so much, but we forget about, we forget about Sarah. Sarah was a great, in my opinion, Sarah was of higher caliber than even her husband Abraham. 
the greatest woman of our faith. Her life played a, it played a pivotal role in the development of the Jewish nation. And her, and her um, values continue even to this day and will continue on for all time. And the Torah is emphasizing that Sarah lived her life on a higher level. How many of you want to live your life at a higher level? Amen. You don't want to live your life at a lower level. You want to live your life at the highest level. Amen. And the Torah also suggests that she lived a double life. Look at your neighbor and say, a double life. Double life means that she lived in this world during the lifetime and that she continued living even in the world to come. That teaches about our existence. We don't cease to exist once we die. We continue to live on forever and ever. Amen? So our souls will live on for forever. And at the resurrection, or at the, um, um, at the resurrection, we will receive new bodies. Our corruptible will be replaced with, the, with incorruptible. Mark chapter 12, verse 26 and 27 say, As, And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then it says in verse 27, He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye, ye therefore do greatly err. So Jesus is saying, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead, they're living. They're living in the afterlife. And if, G, if, 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 God, if, if God the Son, if the Messiah tarries, and you die and go to heaven, you know what? You will live on forever. We don't, we don't cease to exist once we give up our breath. Amen? And the rewards you receive in the afterlife are determined by how you live this life. By your faithfulness in this life will, will determine the rewards that you get in the afterlife. So I really want you to live life to the fullest, and I want you to be fully engaged. You know, some people choose to disengage from life through suicide, or through living lives that will bring about a premature death. But I encourage, I encourage all of you not to live in that manner. Live life to the fullest. And let every breath be used to serve God. And you don't go home until it's time for you to go home. Amen? I want every one of you to complete every mission that God has given you. To put Torah values in your children, your grandchildren, your loved ones, your friends, that you live a life of exemplary character, whether you're with people of your religious faith, your, your belief or not, it doesn't matter that we live our life the same with everybody and we live a life of, 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 of tremendous character. Abraham and Sarah showed hospitality to everybody, not just to the Jews, but also to those that were of other faiths. And I encourage you all to live a lifestyle like that. Amen. That we live a Torah, we live a Torah-centric lifestyle. And likewise, your life does not end with your death. Mark 10.30, again, Jesus says, But ye shall receive a hundredfold now, in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. With persecutions, I like to delete that part, but you know what, that's part of, that's part of our test. The persecutions are part of the test. Persecutions are not just being slain because of your faith in Jesus. Persecutions are any, any test that you experience in life. And then it says that not only do you, get, do you get reward in this life, you also get rewards in the world to come, eternal life. Are you all ready for that? I mean, yeah. the gifts and the blessings that God has for you? Yeah. That means every act of kindness that you show, every time you take care of the poor, you plant wells, uh, you, you plant, you plant wells in Kenya, in Burundi, in Uganda. All the works that you do of hesed, of loving kindness, all around the world, in the Philippines, in, in, um, in Zambia, in many of the nations of the earth. God sees your giving. He sees your tithe. He sees your offering. He sees your sacrifice. And you know what? Every one of that, every bit of sacrifice will be rewarded in this life and in the afterlife. Amen? Amen. The next concept I want to bring out is humility. Can you say humility? humility. The Torah in this word, verse is also emphasizing Sarah's humility. Genesis 23, 1 says, once again, I'm going to read this like a dozen times tonight. And the life of Sarah was 120 years, I'm sorry, was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. 
these were the years of the life of Sarah. Now, before, before I talk about humility, I want you to pay attention to that number 127. Because when, when it comes around for Purim, we're, we're going to be in the book of Esther. Dr. Kral is going to take us in a study on Purim. And Esther 1.1 tells us that King Ahasuerus reigned over 127 provinces. There is a connection between the life of Sarah and the life of Esther. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to go into the teaching on Esther tonight. But I want you to keep this in your mind. Keep this in your notes. And we're going to come back to this when we study the book of Esther. Now I want to talk to you about Esther. Not Esther. Actually, whenever I talk about Sarah, I'm talking about Esther too. Because both are, were a very similar character. There are four levels of humility. How many of you would like to learn the four levels of humility? Amen. All right, number one, to be more humble than the person sitting next to you. No, I'm joking. Uh, num number one is to be more humble than those that are equal. And I'm sorry, to be more humble than those that are greater than you. So should we should strive to be more humble than those that are greater than us. But it doesn't stop there. The second level of humility is to be more humble than your equals. And it doesn't stop there. Number three, to be more humble than those who are lesser than you. That's even harder, harder isn't it? And number four, the, if you are the most humble person, then become more humble than before. In other words, don't stop at your level of humility. Continue to become more humble. Now, hum humility does not equal weakness. Moses was the greatest prophet Israel ever knew. And at the same time, he was the most humble. Amen? Amen. So, the essence of life, in this life and in the life to come, the afterlife, is the essence of both lives, the double life, is, the, is one's humility. So, I'm going to encourage you all, there are so many different character traits. But I encourage each and every one of you to put more emphasis on humility than anything else. Because with the humility comes all the other traits. Amen? If you have humility, love, hesed, comes easy. You know, I remember um, not too long ago, I, I, I went to the um, Trader Joe's in Orange right off of um, Catella and, and Meats. No, I'm sorry, Meats and um, Tustin Avenue. And as I was walk, going back to my car with a shopping cart, there was, there was a homeless lady walking by, and, and she... You know, she, she, she asked me for some money. I, I gave her what I had. Then she went to the guy in the car next to me. And, and I, was, I was really bothered by what he said. But he looked at her with such, with such judgment and looked at her and said, go get a job. And in my opinion, that is really the most arrogant thing you can say to a person. You know, you don't, you don't know what this woman has gone through. She's an, I mean, in my opinion, she was an elderly woman. <clears throat> Looks like she's living on the street, and she's asking for a handout. It's like, you know, how can you, you know, how can we look at people with such arrogance? Because you know what, it could be us in that in, in that condition. It it doesn't take a whole lot for us to end up on the streets. You know, it doesn't. It takes. It could take a few setbacks. It could be the loss of a career. It could be loss of a health. You can lose all of your finances in an instant, just through medical bills in the American system in the American medical system. It doesn't take a whole lot. And it's like, I encourage every one of you is, is to walk in, in humility. And don't judge people in that manner. I mean, because it's, it's, it's probably the most horrible thing you can do because we don't understand every person has a story. A story is not just an Instagram and a Facebook post. Everybody has an individual story. And we, don't know, we need to take time to learn each other's stories. You know, the greatest poverty in America, in my opinion, is, is the poverty of loneliness. And yet we can have all the wealth in the world, and we can have all of our needs taken care of, and we have more than enough. We have the latest iPhones, we have the latest everything. Yet, we're lonely. And I feel like it's getting worse, and it's, it's getting worse and worse. I can't tell you how many times we walk into a restaurant and we'll, we'll, we'll see folks sitting together. No one's talking, they're all on their devices doing stuff, texting or whatever they're doing. 
and, and it, seems to be, it seems to be getting worse and worse. I encourage you, in our culture, especially in American culture, I haven't noticed this so much in India, but I've noticed it here a lot, here, you know, here in Southern California, is let's really take time to connect with one another. And, and let us live life, a lifestyle of demonstrating Torah values. And really just learn, learn how to practice hesed. Learn how to practice loving kindness towards each other. Amen? Amen. And again the scripture, And the life of Sarah was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. You're going to walk out of here tonight with the Genesis 23-1 memorized, I hope. So why is the word years repeated three times? Ask your neighbor that question. I mean, it's written after every number, 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years. This informs us that every number has its own message. Now, according to Rashi, Rashi says, when, Ra when Sarah was 100 years old, she was like a 20-year-old regarding sin. She was like a 7-year-old with regard to beauty. Then, according to a Midrash, God knows the days of the perfect ones, and, the, and their inheritance shall be forever. At 20, she was, she was as beautiful as a 7-year-old. At 100, she was as free from sin as at 20. And then it tells us that God knows the days of the perfect ones. Perfect does not mean you live your life without sin. Perfect means that you live your life with wholeness. And you live life to the fullness. And you accomplish everything, that every test, every assignment that God gives you. You know, I'm not saying that Sarah never failed a test. I know she failed tests. But you know what? She always recovered. And, and she and Abraham passed all tests, all the tests set before them. All ten tests with great distinction. Because without Sarah, Abraham would not have been able to complete those tests. It took both of them together to fulfill those tests. Then the numbers, the, the use of the word years three times, it also alludes to Sarah's perfection in three aspects of her life. These are three areas that we want to work on as well. Number one, the number 100 co corresponds to, the, to, the, to the, the attributes of delight and will. So she was completely submitted to God with, with delight and with her will. The number 20 alludes to two components of her intellect. The chokmah and bina. Can you say that with me? Chokmah and bina. Chokmah and bina is wisdom and understanding. And then the number seven corresponds to the seven emotions. When we, when we come time to preparing for Shavuot or Pentecost, the 49 day journey, we focus on the seven, on the seven primary emotions. Uh, first one is hesed. Can you say hesed? Hesed, hesed is loving kindness. I, um, I'll give you the definition of selfless loving kindness. The second attribute is gavora. Can you say gavora? Gavora. Now, uh, gavora means strength. Isaac excelled in gavora. Abraham excelled in hesed. And the third patriarch is Jacob. He excelled in tiferet, which means truth or beauty. And there are, and a, there are a total of seven emotions, seven, seven of these attributes that we work on. And, and guess what? Sarah excelled in all seven attributes, in all seven emotions. Now, next question I'm going to ask you all is, how did Sarah die? Let's come back to Genesis 23.1. And the life of Sarah was 100 years, and 20 years, and 7 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Life of Sarah, Haya Sarah. How did Sarah die? Well, she died as a result of Yakita. The Yakita was the tenth and final test of Abraham, where God told Abraham to offer his only son, his only son, and sacrifice him on the mountain that I will show you up. And of course, we all know from last week's Parsha that right before he was about to slit the throat of his son Isaac, he heard a voice from heaven telling him to stop. Because God, God does not require human sacrifice. God was testing Abraham's faithfulness. And Abraham stopped. And what happened is, as Sarah, not Sarah, as Abraham 
was was what because Sarah knew the test. She knew exactly what God told Abraham to do. So when Abra when when Abraham went Isaac was coming back to Sarah, Sarah only saw Abraham afar off, and she thought that her son Isaac was dead. And she, she, she died from the shock that her son had died. And she was told by Satan that Abraham had actually slaughtered Isaac. She cried out in grief and died. This is taken from the Targum Yonasan. Uh, and this explains why Abraham and Isaac were not present at her death. She died from the shock of the belief that, that her son was dead. And I don't know if that's true or not, but one thing that does come to mind is, I mean, imagine that she knew that she and Abraham were partners in the, in, in the, in, in the, in, in the spread of monotheism and the spread of Judaism, the spread of the faith all around the world. And what takes place is, without Isaac, the Abrahamic covenant will not continue on. And so Sarah dies from the shock. And there's some that argue, well, Sarah died prematurely. My opinion is that Sarah did not die prematurely. Sarah died at the appointed time. Whether Satan spoke to her or not, I don't know. But uh, one thing I do believe wholeheartedly is that Sarah passed every single test with great distinction, and God took her home when she had fulfilled her assignment here on earth. And my prayer is that none of you will die prematurely. That every one of you will live your life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. I want you to repeat the word Haya Sarah, but replace the word Sarah with your name. Haya Ed. Haya Bhavna. Haya XYZ. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk to you about Sarah's perfection because Genesis 23.1 is also talking about Sarah's perfection. Sarah was a co-founder of the, of the Jewish faith. She was perfect in every detail, and every day of her life was perfect. Her, her life was as whole as it was perfect. Her perfection represents the perfection of the saints. Because our goal in life, and what the Holy Spirit's goal is, is that every one of us come to the full measure of our common. That we obtain the full measure of Christ. Because on Pentecost, or on Shavuot, God, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And He's been with us ever since. He is our helper. And He's going to help us to live every day, every moment, every second of our life to the very fullest. Amen? I, and I, my desire is that every one of you obtain, attain the high level, the high calling you have in Christ Jesus. Don't compromise your life to enjoy a moment of juicy gossip. Don't compromise your life to, to work in a way that's not to your fullest. But live every moment of your life, not looking for shortcuts, but to live every single moment to its fullest. Amen. Amen. And Sarah was an equal participant in the spread of the Abrahamic faith. In Genesis seventeen fifteen. It says, God said to Abraham, Sarai, your wife. Do not call her by the name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. And just as God took the, the letter He from the, tetra, the Tetragrammaton, the yud heh vav -He, God took the He from his name and gave it to Abram, so Abram became Abraham. God took the He from his name and also added the He to Sarah's name, and her name was transformed from Sarai to Sarah. Amen? So they, that tells us that they both had a share in the same spiritual mission to spread the faith of uh, to spread the faith of Hashem, the faith of God throughout the earth. And just as Abraham was called the father of a multitude of nations, she is called a princess to the entire world. So Abraham is not just the father of the Jewish faith; he is the father to the nations of the world. Sarah is not just a mother to the Jewish faith. She is a mother to the nations of the world. She's actually, she was crowned as a mother of the multitude. And they achieved, their, they achieved their goals together. Can you say together? together? That's one of the beauties about marriage. 
about the covenant of marriage. Marriage is a covenant. It's not something that you choose to leave behind when it's not convenient anymore or you're not getting your needs met any longer. Marriage is a covenant. And together, you can accomplish so much together. I'm telling you because God, God brings couples together. There's things that you can do together that you can't do separately. Amen? Not saying that when you get married that you give up your individuality. One of the beauties of marriage is that you encourage your partner to achieve their highest level. And you encourage your partner to go, your spouse, your husband, and your wife, to, 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 to live life to the fullest and to accomplish what God has called them to do. And you do that for one another. My wife does not nullify her desires to follow my desires. And I don't nullify my desires to, to follow her desires. It, that doesn't make for a very healthy marriage. We, 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 live, we, we push, not push, but we encourage each other to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. And at the same time, there are goals that we accomplish together. And this is what Abraham and Sarah accomplished together. They became the parents of, the, of, of, of our faith. Amen? Next thing I want to talk to you about is Sarah's <laughs> prophetic voice. Can you say that with me? Sarah's yes. prophetic yes. voice. Yes. Now let's go to the second verse of our teaching. Genesis 16.2 And Sarai said, and we're going back to the previous parsha, Lech Lecha, for a moment. Genesis 16, 2 says, And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Please come to my handmaid. Per perhaps I will, I will be built up from her. And Abram, or Avram, hearkened to Sarai's voice. Now when we read this, don't most of us think, you know, we, we have this thought, we've been taught this, that Sarai did not have enough faith in God, and because she was barren, she took matters into her own, own hands and thought, well, I'll give our handmaid Hagar to my husband Avram, and then she'll conceive, then she'll conceive through Hagar. Hagar will become pre pregnant, bear a son, and that will, become, that will become the son that will carry in the covenant. Isn't that what you've been taught? And because and Sarah lacked in faith? That's not what the rabbis teach. The rabbis teach that when we read the words to Sarai's voice, Sarai's voice corresponds to the divine spirit within her. The Holy Spirit was speaking through Sarai and telling her exactly what needed to be done. So it was God's will for Ishmael to be born. Ishmael was not an accident. Ishmael is part of God's plan in the creation. Remember, Abraham and Sarah are, uh, are, are, the, are, are the, father, uh, the father and mother of nations. Amen? Ish, through Ishmael came, came forth many of the Arab, nation, Arab nations. Ishmael was part of God's plan. He's still part of God's plan. So Hagar, and who was Hagar? <clears throat> exactly. Hagar was the Egyptian maidservant of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Do you remember when Abraham came out of Egypt with great spoil? Part of that spoil was receiving Hagar. Hagar was a princess in Egypt. She was a daughter of Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought, it's better that my daughter dwells with Abraham and Sarah than, than with me in Egypt. So a princess became the servant. Very interesting, isn't it? Something you probably never, you, you learn this from rabbinic commentary. This is not found in the, in the reading of the scriptures. And I mean, imagine, I mean, th this is so amazing because when we look at Ruth, because we're going to study about Ruth tonight as well, Ruth cleaved to her mother in law, Naomi. Who was Ruth? Ruth and her sister Orpah were daughters of King Eglon of Moab. They were royalty, they were princesses, daughters of the king. And, and Ruth chose to become, she chose to live as a servant to Naomi rather than be a princess back in, in Moab after, you know, after her husband had died. So you're going to see, you're going to see many, you're going to see many parallels as you read through, through the Bible. But here it says, it was, Sarah's voice is a word of prophecy. And Sarah lived her life to the fullness, and she lived her life in the will of God. I know this is hard for many of you to grasp this. 
But all I'm going to ask you, I'm not asking you to embrace my opinion. I'm just asking you to ponder what I'm teaching you this evening. Can, you all, can, can I ask you all to do that? Yeah. I know some of you are looking at me kind of puzzled because it completely contradicts what you, what you, what you have been taught in, in, your, in your biblical studies. But I want you to consider this opinion because Sarah is a righteous woman. Sarah is the first matriarch of Israel. And, and what does Abram do? What does Avram do? He hearkened to Sarah's voice because he knew that Sarah's voice was the voice of prophecy. And sometimes God's going to ask you to do things that you do not want to do. Because you know what? Life is a yes. test. You pass that test. Excellent. <clears throat> now, another thing I want to... Hagar was the maidservant of Sarah. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Who was the manservant of Abraham? You said it. You're right. Eliezer. Can you all say Eliezer? Eliezer. Now, what I, I, this is not in my teach, teaching tonight, but I'll share it with you anyway. Um, we know that Abraham was converting the males, and Sarah was converting the, the, the females. Because they, they were both Torah scholars, and they were converting the people, the nations, to the monotheistic faith. To, to faith in the God of Abraham, which, which is Hashem, the Lord God. And who assisted Sarah in, in the ministry? Hagar. Who assisted Abraham in his ministry? Eliezer. See, don't, don't treat these servants like people of very low caliber. They were people of extremely high caliber, and they, they, were, very, they were very well versed in, in Torah study. I can think of no better teacher than having Abraham or Sarah be my teachers. And so, and Eliezer and Hagar were, were trained by Abraham and Sarah, respectively. And it must have been a tremendous test for Sarah to tell Abraham, take my maidservant and, and marry her and have a child through her. Then another scripture I want to share with you is Genesis 21.10. And Sarah said to Abraham, drive out this maidservant and her son, for the son of this handmaid shall not inherit with my son with Isaac. See, Sarah, again, was operating in divine prophecy. She was capable of discerning the uniqueness of the Jewish people, and she, and she, she knew that Ishmael had to be driven out. She knew that, that Abrahamic faith would only pass through Isaac, through Yitzhak. And Sarah, very strong, demanded that her husband, Abraham, banish Hagar and Ishmael from their household. And can you imagine how hard it was for Abraham? You're telling me to cast out my son. And it was so serious that God appears to Abraham in Genesis 21, 12 and says, And God said to Abraham, Be not, dis be not displeased concerning the lad and concerning your handmaid. Whatever Sarah tells you, hearken to her voice, for an Isaac will be called your seed. You see God confirming the word that came forth first through Sarah. Do you, do you see how connected Sarah is to God? And even when Abraham hesitates, Sarah does not hesitate. You know, we've been taught that Sarah was a jealous co-wife. And she did she and she wasn't with and she was and that's not the case. Sarah was the most generous, I mean, woman I've ever read about in the Bible. I mean, and she, she, was a, she was such a woman of God, and she knew the voice of prophecy. The rabbis tell us that Sarah's prophetic gifts were even greater than that of Abraham. And after Sarah died, Abraham's level of prophecy actually decreased a bit. I mean, can you imagine God saying, coming to you, I'm speaking to the men now, imagine God coming to you into a dream and saying, Brother Ed, listen to the voice of your wife. Sure. Or God appearing to me and saying, listen to the voice of your, husband, of your wife, Bhavna. And, uh, and most of the time, Bhavna is right when we have a disagreement. But, no, no buts there. Because often God will speak through our... Often women are more receptive to the voice of prophecy than, than, than we guys are. If you agree with me, please say amen. 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 All the women say amen. All the women said amen. 
Now let's come, now let's, let's leave that topic and let's come to the, let's come to the mysterious cave of Machpelah. Now last week I was talking to you about caves. I don't remember the topic, but we were talking about caves. And I made a comment saying that I've seen incredible caves in, in, um, in Pune, India, but I've never seen any caves here. And uh, who, who sent me a text or an email? Sister Kwame sent me an email with all the incredible caves we have here in, in Orange County. So if you want to know about those caves, please send me a note and I'll, and I'll forward that note to you. We have amazing caves in Southern California, but I have not seen any. So now let's talk about a mysterious cave. Can you all look at your neighbor and say, a mysterious cave? A mysterious cave. Called Machpela. Is that correct? Machpela? Genesis 23.9. I'm going to invite you to, to follow along with me. That he may give me Machpela. Machpela means double. And here is Abraham in this chapter negotiating with Ephron for the fields that had the cave called Ma, uh, that, that he, want, he, he was negotiating with the, the elders of this town because he wanted to buy the burial plot for Sarah. And the word Machpelah, Machpela, it means double. Can you say double? Double. It's called, so it's a double cave, and it was at the end of the field. And Abraham paid full price for, for, the, for that piece of burial property. Some teach that it was, a, it was the, the word Machpela means double. They say that it was like a house with, with an upper level and a lower level, like two stories. Another interpretation is that it was doubled for couples. Because four couples were buried there. Adam and Eve were, were buried in that, in that cave. Abraham and Sarah were buried in that cave. Which we're going to read about Sarah. Sarah in this part here, Sarah was buried. And later on, after Abraham died, he was buried in the same place next to his wife Sarah. And Yitzhak and Rivka were buried there, Isaac and Rebekah. And Yaakov and Leah, Jacob and Leah, were buried in that cave as well. So four couples were buried in that cave. Ephron did not know that Adam and Eve were buried there. That's really all I want to share about this cave here. But there's something, there's, there's, there's a lot of rabbinic teachings about this cave. One of the teachings is, Abraham bought a cubit of land for each of the 600,000 Jews who left Egypt. So there were 600,000 men that left Egypt, not counting women and children. And Abraham bought, I would assume that Abraham bought 600,000 cubits of land. See, everything that Abraham does, or what Sarah does, it's not, we're not just reading about history. It, every step they took, every word they spoke, everything they did was a signpost for future generations. Amen. Abraham and Sarah came out of Egypt, Egypt with great substance. Well, in the future, about 400 or so years later, Israel came out of Egypt with tremendous wealth. And through every exile that Jewish people have gone through, they always come out with great substance. You know, and none of us can really comprehend why the Holocaust happened. And many people question, why did God allow the Holocaust to happen? The most cruel, probably one of the most cr the cruel things recorded in history. I, I mean, a, a wicked man like Hitler committing the most horrific crime and trying to wipe out Jewry in the entire world. It would, not have, it, would, it would not have stopped just in Eastern Europe. It would have, continu it, it would have continued throughout the world if Hitler were, were allowed to continue. But, and, we, and many ask that question, how can there be a God when, when God allowed this to happen? And it's a question I cannot answer. There, there are things in God's plan that I do not comprehend. And the wickedness, the depths that, of wickedness that mankind can descend to. I mean, the merciless killing of, 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 of how many Jews in a synagogue? Was it 11? Was it 11? It just, it's just, un, I, I can't imagine it. Just, just the, the, the pure hatred. And I don't understand it, and I, can't, I cannot explain why the, why, why the Holocaust happened. But all I can encourage all of you that have that pain and that anger, and, I, and it's understandable anger, is I don't know the answer, but I know that God is moving behind the scenes. I know God is in control. 
And I'm telling you, these, death, these deaths were not meaningless deaths. These, I, I, I'd rather not say, you know, maybe it was a John that was killed in the Holocaust, was murdered or, or, or put in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. I would rather say the life of John, the life of Steve, the life of whoever, the, the life of Moshe, rather than the death, because not a single one of these deaths was, was meaningless. Every life was filled with purpose. Amen? And God knows the end from the beginning. I, the things I cannot explain, you know, a mother that loses their child, I mean, how, how can you comfort a mom or a dad that loses their child? It's impossible. But you know what? But it, it's... it's it's a part of the human existence, and God knows everything. And God knows the good that's going to come forth in the future. But I can't explain it. I, I've done so much studies on, 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 on this type of suffering. I, I have no answer. All I know is there are things, God's ways are higher than my ways. And there are things that I, I may never understand, but so be it. My goal is not to become God. My goal is, is just to become like God and to become more... Be, to come into the full image that God has for us. But I am not God, you are not God. Amen? Amen. Now in Genesis 23, 2, and Sarah died in Kirj um, Artharba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. I want to talk to you about the Torah concept behind grieving. Abraham mourned and wept at Sarah's death. Can you repeat after me? Abraham mourned and wept at Sarah's death. Weeping and mourning are two different stages of bereaving. Now I know a couple of you are, are uh, the couple of ladies in here are, are at least at least two of you are, are widows in, in this room, and you 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 can understand this concept at a much greater depth than I can understand it. Because I can't really teach something I have not experienced. But the Torah teaches there are two distinct reactions to a tragedy or to a death. Weeping is the first stage. Especially when the death occurs without warning. And it's not a deliberate performance. But it's just weeping is the release of unbearable tension when the whole world seems to be crumbling. I remember, I remember the very first time in my life where I had, I, I had seen someone at the church. Was, I used the, at the time I was back, I must have been like about 11, 12 years old, and I was attending the Salvation Army Church in Anaheim. And at the church, um, there was a, a lady, her husband had just passed away early, early Sunday morning. And I remember that morning, and she was like, I mean, she was wailing. I mean, weeping like I'd never seen before. And it was probably the very first time in my life that, that I had seen, been in a situation where I saw a widow mourning uh, over the death of her husband. And we're on the church grounds, and uh, I mean, it was like even more that, there was so much emotion and weeping and grief, it was more than I could even bear to handle. And she, she had been, I mean, the grief was so unbearable that she had spent the entire morning drinking, so at the same time she was she, she was intoxicated, but she was just trying to manage that horrifying grief. And the one thing I saw wrong in that situation is, and it reminds me of Parsha Noah, but part when when Noah was found and uncovered in his tent, was in that state, the leaders should have taken her to a place, to where she would not expose herself anymore. To, you know, because she, she, she was cursing, that she was intoxicated, mm -hmm. and she was saying things she shouldn't have been saying. I mean, it was, it was, I, mean I don't blame her at all. It was, it was unbearable grief, and it was part of the process. But she should have been surrounded by others and taken to a place to where they could help her mm -hmm. through that morning. Because you, you just, there's nothing you can do but just let, just let her work, work, walk through that grief. Walk through it. And let her do whatever, but let, let it be to where it's not right out in the open. And that, do you all agree with that? Because all of us have times in our lives where we're exposed. You know, someone does something to us that sets us off. You get a text message that is so far from the truth and you're so upset about it. Sometimes you need a, people around you that will, will, that will actually keep you from even sinning. But just, just to help protect you. So that's the first stage. Of course, the text is nothing. L losing your spouse is a horrifying pain to go through. 
And I, I'm even thinking about a friend on Facebook who, where her, her child was kidnapped and she has no idea where her child is. I, I cannot comprehend that kind of grief. Unbearable grief. I think the loss of someone without knowing where they are is probably worse than an actual death. Because at least with death, you have some closure. But with, with, with a kidnapping, you have, is, where's my child? Is my child being used in prostitution? Is my child uh, being tortured? You know, all these thoughts are going through your mind, and I believe that pain is, is a lot worse. But it doesn't matter, I'm not, they're both very painful things to go through. So after the weep, weeping stage, the second stage of bereavement is known as mourning. Hebrew word is hesped. And mourning is, is, is rational, and it's a planned performance. That's really when you get to a point where you go, I, I know my husband or my wife has passed away, and I love my spouse with my, with my whole heart. And that play, that person will always have that primary spot in my heart. But at the same time, you know that you have to move on with living. So that's where, that's where you learn how you, you make adjustments. You, you, you learn how to live with that pain. And I remember years ago, I met this real estate agent. I, I forgot what, what we were doing, but she was showing me homes. And I think she had lost her husband in that last year. She, she, she told me she was taught when you lose your spouse, the last thing you want to do is sell your home. You, 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 you want to change as little as, as possible. But I see most people do contrary to that. I see folks that have lost their spouses that right away, they start giving everything away, anything that reminds them of their spouse, and they sell their home and everything. I don't know what's right or wrong, but uh, uh, in, in that area, I mean, I can give you no advice in that area, but what, what I do want you to understand is that Torah does recognize mourning, and it recognizes you don't stay in that state of weeping, even though you're gonna lose it from time to time. That's totally normal. Especially when it comes around time for birthdays and wedding anniversaries. Those will probably be the low points in your life. And it, it's just part of the cross that, that you have to carry. But, but the good thing is that joy does come in the morning. And the morning is the process. It's, it's more rational. It's where you, 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 you kind of just work things out. I'm teaching, the, I'm teaching this to you because all of us are going to face this at some point in our life. You can either choose to completely seclude yourself and go live in a cave and have no connection with anybody. That would be a miserable life. Or you can just choose to follow the Torah path and when, when death occurs, that you learn how to walk through it. And just know there are going to be times you're going to lose it. There's times you're going to be angry. There will be times that you may blame God. Amen. But you know what? Just walk through the process. Mm -hmm. Because the Torah will help you through every single situation. And you can rely upon each other. You can't go through this on your own. There's no way. And, and with Bob and, and myself, there are relationships that, that, were, that were stripped out of our lives. And there were bridges that, and, and people burned bridges so we could never cross back. But you know what? In those situations, God gave us relationships. He's given us, he's given us more than we had before. And so just, just let the Torah give you the strength to get to get to the destination and live the process enjoy the process Amen. and just just let God take take you through it we always think of life I need to get from point A to point B but you know what you need to enjoy the process between step A and step B my little nephew Kavya cannot wait until the weekend because that's when he's off from school so he's counting the days down and but you know he's still too little to to teach about just enjoy the process. And even in my work days, I go, again, it's TGIF, it's, 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 you know, thank God it's Friday. But you know what? We need to learn how to enjoy each day and live each day to its fullest. I'm still learning this myself. All right, ready for the next step? Are we done with the mourning and the grieving? Let's, let's talk about something that's a little more fun to talk about. Finding one's life partner. If you're single, no, I should, just a, uh, uh, Finding one life's partner. In Genesis 24, 6, Abraham said to him, notice in this section here in verse 7, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, it's, it's talking about Abraham's servant Eliezer, but Eliezer's name is not mentioned at all. Abraham said to him, Beware lest you return my son back there, the Lord God of the heavens, whom, who took me from my father's house, 
and from the land of my birth, and who spoke about me, and who swore to me, saying, To your seed will I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and he will take a wife for my son from there. And if a woman will not wish to go after you, you shall be absolved of this my oath. Only do not return my son back there. So here Abraham is, is making a covenant and, a, and giving a command to Eliezer, his servant, telling him to go back to his home, go back to Haran, and, 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 and get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, Eliezer's name is not mentioned on purpose. Moses intentionally wrote this without Eliezer's name. And the reason why his name is excluded is to show us the humility of Eliezer. Eliezer desired that Isaac marry his son, I mean, his daughter. But you know what? But that wasn't part of God's plan. So Eliezer humbled himself and followed Abraham's command exactly. And now, why wasn't Eliezer allowed to take Isaac with him? I mean, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be nice that Isaac could meet his future bride? I mean, he did not, Eliezer did not go back to Abraham's birthplace with an, with, with an, with an iPhone and FaceTime Isaac and say, do you like her? Is she the one? Is she the one? They, they had no conversation. There, were, there was no communication. No communication whatsoever. Abraham trusted Eliezer so much that God would direct him to the very woman that God had ordained for Isaac's life. And the question that we may ask is, why didn't Abraham take a bride for Yitzhak or Isaac from the land of Canaan, the land they were living in? Why did Abraham send Eliezer back to his birthplace? That's a good question, isn't it? You know, why? Well, the, the people of both lands were idolaters. So whether Abraham found a wife for his son from Canaan, they wouldn't fit his faith because they, they, they were Canaan, they were, they were idolaters. And if they, if they found a wife for Isaac from the, the, his homeland, they were idolaters too. So what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. Because what Abraham was looking for was a girl that was worthy of the Abrahamic covenant. He was looking for a bride for Isaac that would be a partner with Isaac to continue on the Abrahamic covenant, to continue on the spread of monotheism, continue to continue on the teachings of Torah, to continue on the bloodline of Messiah. There was one problem with the people of Canaan, was it wasn't just their disposition, it, it, was, it, it was their, um, what, what was the word? It was, it was the, their horrible character traits. And so it, I, let's forget about idolatry because idolatry is just a cultural thing. It's something that people can be taught and remove, remove idolatry. But what Abraham was dealing with here is at least for the, the people from Haran, is that they, they, there are people there that have greater character. So when you're looking for a spouse for your children, I don't know if you do that, I don't know if I'm, we do that here in America, but if, if you're looking for your own spouse, when you look for your spouse, don't look at just the outward appearance. You need to look at character. That is more important than anything. And that's what Eliezer found when he found Rivka or Rebecca. He found a woman of tremendous character. So he had, he had to go to Abraham's birthplace to find, to find, to find this girl. This Parsha is ca sometimes called uh, Shiduk Parsha, because this is a Parsha that's often used to teach about uh, marriages and finding your life partner. And why did Abraham send Eliezer to Haran to find a wife? The reason is the people of Canaan were morally degenerate. They weren't easily repairable. But the people of Haran did not have that natural disposition. Because idol worship is an intellectual error, it's something that can be easily, easily fixed. But character flaws are not very easily fixed. So the Canaanites were morally degenerate and were innately dishonorable. 
You know, how do you make a dishonorable person honorable? It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And first of all, that person at first needs to want to become honorable. Yeah. If they're not willing to become honorable, there's no point, there's no point pursuing that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, so often I see, I see single folks um, get married with the thought, well, I know that this, my spouse or my partner has all these issues, but I can fix it. And that's a very dangerous place to go. Very dangerous. And sometimes, I mean, there are times I wish I could just say something, but I bite my tongue because it's not my place. That I'm not asked for my opinion. But sometimes, you know, we, we can't fix each other. And if you don't want to be fixed, there's no way anybody else is going to fix you. So that's, that's the reason why Abraham sent Eliezer back to Haran and did not choose a bride for Isaac from the land of Canaan. So when you're looking for your spouse, you, you need to focus on character traits. Are, are the, I mean, is the person that you, that you your potential mate, is, is, is he or she of, of good character? Is that person moral? What is that person's faith like? Is that person easily angered? Is that person envious? Is that person driven towards jealousy? You know, these are all things you need to think about. I remember this one couple in this ministry, and they, um, they, they didn't get married, but they, they did get engaged. And I, I don't want to say too much, because you might figure out who I'm speaking about. But one person in this partnership was, was very, very, very suspicious very jealous, and when her, uh, well, when her partner was talked to someone of the opposite sex, immediately she would get very jealous, extremely jealous. And I tell them, if that's what you're bringing in the relationship, you don't want to carry that into marriage because a marriage will not last. You need to look out for jealousy. Jealousy is very envy. I mean, it's a, it's a very these are very strong character flaws that they need to be fixed before you enter in, into the covenant of marriage. So, I mean, you want to look for kindness, refinement, patience, humility, generosity, a positive, a positive attitude towards life. Be aware of those that gossip a lot, who are quick-tempered, arrogant, cynical, unforgiving, miserly, jealous, and selfish. How many of you want a spouse like that? That's unforgiving? Please raise your hand. None of us do. And don't be blinded by the looks and by glamour. And Eliezer, he completely, he completely relied upon God to direct him to the future bride of Sarah, I mean, of, of Isaac. So, you know what Eliezer did? I mean, he's the best matchmaker in the world. Eliezer goes on that journey, and, and he, gives, he, he has a litmus, a litmus test. And, he's, and he says... Lord, let the maiden that you have chosen for Isaac, let her, without me asking, let her give me a jug. Of, let her give me water, give my servants water, and also give water to my camels. And on, on Monday night at MST at Melody Land School of Theology, Dr. Crowell told us that each camel consumes about 22 gallons of water. So Rebecca, when she gave water to all the camels. I mean, it must have taken half a day for her to, to, to give enough water to, to all the camels. That, and that was Elias' test. His prayer was, he says, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. Show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. So I would guess this is the place where people came to meet other single folk. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed to thy servant Isaac. And she demonstrated unbelievable kindness. Here's Rebecca, the sister of the most wicked man of the Middle East, Laban. Laban was so wicked, so selfish, so greedy. All he cared about was I, 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 I. And yet his sister was the exact opposite, who was a woman, a girl of tremendous hesed. Now, you know, I, 
I'm going to teach you something that I, I, I'm going to ask one of you to research this for me. I've been doing this for years and I haven't found the answer yet. I'm going off on a tangent here. I do that once in a while. Here's the tangent. When Isaac was offered on the altar and he was about to be sacrificed, he was 37 years old. At the time that he was about to be sacrificed, at the time of the Akita, eight, um, he was 37 years old and Rebecca was born. Three years later, Isaac is 40 years old. Eliezer is sent to Haran to find a bride for Isaac. He meets Rebecca, and at that time, according to my math, she's three years old. How can a three-year-old give water to all those camels and do all that she did? So, and, and I think it was Rashi's commentary that says that she was three years old. So I'm going to ask, and I, I, I know that's not true. There's no way she could have been three years old. But I'm going to ask you all, I'm going to give you all a homework assignment. If you're willing to take it, please say amen. Be careful about saying amen. But if you, if you choose to accept this assignment, Sister Cheryl, if you choose to accept it, I want you to, I want you to find an explanation for me on, on that whole story. Because, I mean, I know Rashi's commentary is usually at the level of, of the shot, of the simple understanding, but I don't understand his commentary here. So when I teach you Torah, I'll teach you what makes sense, and I'll teach you things that don't make sense to me at all. But I, I believe there's a deeper understanding to this text here. Now I'm going to teach you something else about what took place here. The, the journey that Eliezer took to get from Canaan, Israel, to, to the Haran in Syria was a 17-day journey. The Lord shrunk the trip journey time from 17 days down to one day. So God made his journey successful in an instant. I mean, God answered Elias' prayer right away. And it reminds me of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew 8, Jesus entered into Capernaum. And there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. Verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Then in verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed. So be it done unto you, and his servant was healed in the self-same hour. What I want to show you here is sometimes the faith of the Gentiles is, is phenomenal. Even Jesus was blown away by the faith of, of, this gen, of this Gentile believer. And Eliezer was a Gentile believer. And even Ruth was a Gentile believer who became a convert to Ju Judaism. All three demonstrated tremendous faith in God. And the takeaway here is, God is the ultimate matchmaker. We must trust Him to send us our destined life partner, and He will surely do so. Now, over the years, I've seen different people make lists of what they look for in a spouse. I don't know if that's good or not, but I'm, recently I saw uh, uh, one young lady write a list of things that she wanted in her spouse. All incredible things. The only thing I didn't really like was that he had to be a vegan. But it was all these things that were, li all these things that were listed on what, what, what she desired in her future spouse. And I don't ever, I don't ever re remember making a list of what I desire in a spouse. But one thing I do remember is years, years ago when I was new in the ministry, and Dr. Carell, Dr. Michelle Carell, and her husband, uh, Pastor Manuel Carell, they, they were both serving at a at a at a Thanksgiving uh, event, and they were they, they were serving Thanksgiving meals to, to the homeless, and I, I was. I was there at that Thanksgiving, and I saw I saw the love that this couple had for one another. You know, Bob and I had a chance to share this with Pastor on Saturday, and it's just like I mean, what I saw in their marriage, and all I said is, Lord, this is the kind of marriage I want. I mean, a marriage where each partner was completely committed to the other person, and they were like that twenties. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, Bob, that's nineteen ninety one, ninety two, uh, uh, that many years ago. And they're, they're no different today. 
In fact, they love each other more today than ever. And I go, Lord, that is what I want in my marriage. And of course, I, want, I, mean, I wanted somebody beautiful, and the Lord gave me way, uh, God blew that requirement away. I mean, because he, he gave me way more than I even asked for. And what's even worth more than all of that is Bob and his character. I it, it mean, it's, it's, every, it's everything. And even through every single trial, her character c continues to become more and more refined. Amen. And I encourage you all to look for those qualities in your spouse. Don't go after the Disney spouse. Don't go after your Aladdin or Jasmine, <laughs> like Ed did. Don't, 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 don't go out looking for your... Uh, no, I'm just joking. You know, look, look for character above all else. And you know what? When you do that, God will cut that 17-day journey short. And you'll complete it in a day. You know, stop looking for that Bollywood or Hollywood look or, or, or whatever you see on the front of a, 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 a magazine cover at the grocery store. Don't, that, that's all phony. It's not real. Look, look for character. And look for hesed, kindness above all else. I mean, Sarah, I mean, not Sarah, Rebecca or Rivka demonstrated tremendous character. And I would say that by Rashi calling her three years old, I would say that she was, th she was like a th three-year-old in, in terms of her purity. Her character, exactly. So I think we answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she, Rebecca was a girl of tremendous character, and she was worthy to become the wife of Isaac. And pure kindness, watch out, Brother Michael, here comes my joke. Pure hesed <laughs> is the ability to shrink the eye so that one recognizes and becomes sensitive to what others are lacking. So the eye, the capital I, can you say capital I? Yeah. is replaced with a lowercase i. The i shrinks because it's no longer about me, but it's about you. Yeah. Right, princess? It's not about me, it's about you. So pure hesed, or pure loving kindness, is the ability to shrink the i so that one recognizes and becomes sensitive to, to what others are lacking. And that is why the i in iPhone is small. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> do we have any comments? Diminishing yourself leads to really listening to what your friends need. You know, most conversations are a tug of war. It's like Ed on one side of the room, Gregory on the other side of the room with, with a piece of rope and they're tugging and they're, pull, they're pulling the rope. And so when Ed is winning, he's actually leading the conversation. And when he weakens, Gregory gets his word in and he's pulling and he's winning and he's, he's getting his word. So it's like little eye, big eye, big eye, little eye, going, going back and forth. And when we interrupt, we move the focus of attention to ourselves, the big eye. When we listen, we show that we care. So how, in our conversations, how much of your conversation is about I, uppercase I, and how much of your conversation is lowercase I? Amen? That's we good. all need to become like the iPhone. <clears throat> so we, we need to learn how to decrease and, and, and really learn how to listen. I think one of the biggest skills we're missing in our society is the ability, ability to really listen and to connect and to empathize, and to show empathy. You know, we know the story about Ruth and Orpah. Ruth and Orpah were the two daughters-in-law of Naomi. Their husbands died. Orpah, her name means back of the neck, from the word Oreth. And what does she do? After, when Naomi told her to go home, she hightailed it back to, she wept, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really real mourning, and she hightailed it back to Moab. Ruth, on the other hand, comes from the word Ra'ata, which means she saw, and that means that she perceived the greatness of her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she cleaved to Naomi, and she became a, con a convert to the Jewish faith. And she became, she became an, an ancestress of Messiah, and she became the great-grandmother of King David. 
because she decreased the I and she submitted. Amen? So tonight, Holy Spirit, tonight I ask you, Lord God, that teach us how to decrease the way John the Baptist decreased, that you may increase. And even in our conversations and our relationship, may we learn how to become listeners and not only speakers, but may we really learn how to connect with one another in Jesus' name. As we conclude here, Isaac's prayer life, Isaac, was, Isaac went forth to pray in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, camels were approaching. It was during the afternoon when, when Isaac was praying that he saw Eliezer bring in Rebekah. Because what Isaac instituted into the faith was afternoon prayer. His father Abraham introduced morning prayer. Isaac introduced afternoon prayer. And Isaac's son Jacob introduced evening prayer. So therefore now we have three periods of prayer during the day. And the next thing I want to talk to you about is meeting of opposites. Yitzhak, I'm going to really just shorten this teaching. I'm going to shorten this 17 hour teaching into 17 minutes. <laughs> So shortly after his marriage, you know, Yitzhak excelled in the character trait of strength. In contrast, his wife Rebecca excelled in the character trait of Hesed, loving kindness. It was almost like it was a meeting of two opposites. And with that, I am, we are going to close. I shortened it down into one minute instead of seventeen. I'm going to invite you all just to stand with me for a moment. And Lord, tonight, I just ask you, Lord God, that may this teaching tonight bear so much fruit in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise.